Sir, you are already online. Yes. How much time before? Oh, five, maybe five or seven minutes. Just okay. listening. I, I was just uh, thinking, I was waiting. I was thinking you will speak something, then I will stop. So No, no, no. I was enjoying watching your technique. It's no, very no. nice. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please just start. Yeah, no problem. I seriously, I was enjoying, so I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> Thank, you. Want. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you very much. All right, very impressive. My congratulations. I can share my screen and I can show you uh, my talk. Today is a little different. I'm not going to show a video. I want to talk about something that's very. I promise I'll show lots of videos again in the new year. But I, I wanted to talk about a program that I've spent uh, the last twelve years developing, based on how we as surgeons can best deal with rectal cancer. And you know, the things that we need to focus on for rectal cancer are margins, how much we do it, uh, how we do it, and how we put the patient back together. And, and the reason is that it, it, it used to be thought that people needed a five centimeter long distal margin. But what was shown uh, back in 1983 was that you didn't need five centimeters. There's no reason to give people permanent colostomies because whether the margin was more than five or less than two, the recurrence rate and the survival were no different. And in fact, Norman Williams did a similar study in the same year in Leeds and found the same thing, that the only people who had more than five centimeters of distal spread had poorly differentiated disease at that time called Duke C. Now it would be TNM. Uh, stage three disease, and they died of, of not of the distal intramural spread, but of distant disease. What turned out to be important, in fact, was not this tumor going distally, but tumor going around and having tumor in the lateral resection margin, which subsequently became known as the circumferential resection margin. And all of this happened around the same time in the early 80s. And it, it was proven over time that circumferential resection margin positivity. If you had a negative margin, you did much better for five-year disease-free survival and five-year overall survival than if you had a positive circumferential resection margin. So it's not a matter of getting past the tumor distally, it's getting around the tumor. And over time, Gina Brown and in, in the Imperial uh, in London showed us at the Royal Marsden Hospital in Imperial showed us that MRIs could give such high resolution, high definition image that we could tell in advance if the margin was going to be uh, involved and treat that patient appropriately. And you can see this phenomenal correlation between what's seen on the MRI and what's seen on the path specimen. So that patients with a threatened margin in whom we knew there's going to be an increased risk of local recurrence and decreased survival, we could give them neoadjuvant therapy. And in fact, it was shown by Gina Brown and others that the uh, MRI involvement was just as strong a predictor as was the ultimate path involvement. Look, look at the difference for negative margins uh, and positive margins. This is unbelievable, huge differences. So what all that translated to was, was described by Bill Heald around the same time, and that is take out the entire mesorectal envelope. And the reason the distal margin didn't matter is because this tumor isn't what's going to kill somebody. It's these tumor deposits in the fat in the mesorectum. So what he suggested, rather than having to take, uh, do an abdominal perineal resection, go below the tumor, two centimeters being more than sufficient, but remove the entirety of the mesorectum. And that became the, the teaching. And you can see with total mesorectal excision how that local recurrence rate, which used to be double digits, used to be 20% and plus all over the world, dropped down to low single digit local recurrence rates in, in the UK, in, in uh, the US, in Japan, in Scandinavia, in New Zealand, in, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Hong Kong, all these different authors describing low local recurrence rates, as opposed to what they had been before TME, of rates around 20%. And then the question is, how did that stack up against um, adjuvant? At that time, we weren't using neoadjuvant therapy, we were using adjuvant therapy. And what was described here was Bill Heal's rate of TME, local recurrence of 
in the paper by Crook and, and co-workers in the New England Journal of Medicine, 1991, they described using adjuvant therapy for high-risk patients, threatened margins. Their local recurrence rate is 22%. So which is better, the mesoarctic excision here or the local recurrence here? Uh, or, sorry, or the adjuvant therapy here. Mm-hmm. And and with in the U.S., they were so excited that they decreased the, uh, the, the um, or rather they improved upon rates by adding adjuvant therapy in fact heal did better all along so they had dropped their rates of um, local recurrence rate from 25 percent to 13 and a half percent by adding this adjuvant chemotherapy to the normal regimen of surgery and post-op radiation adding chemo the rates went in half but still didn't get to where heals were similarly here the overall recurrence rate went from 62.7 without chemotherapy to 41.5 with chemotherapy. And, and Bill Heald has been a dear friend of mine since 1984, so just close to 40 years, and, and we've done many surgeries together. And He's shown me the importance of not producing a specimen with part of the mesorectum missing, but rather to have a nice, complete TME specimen, as I've shown you in, in prior videos. The classic study was the first one to show in very specific terms the definition of incomplete, near complete, or complete mesorectum. And that's really important. Complete and near complete act the same in terms of survival and local recurrence. Incomplete is the problem. And the reason is near complete could be from specimen extraction. It could be from rectal manipulation during surgery. Incomplete means you've actually torn something or left something behind. So... Number one, you need the specimen. Number two, who's producing the specimen? And it's been shown in many places that it's dependent on both volume and training. So this is a study out of Canada, and you can see the statistics of of who participated. And hang on, I'm missing a slide there. Uh, Well, I know what the data showed, and the data basically showed that the rates of, um, of local recurrence and survival were vastly better for these five colorectal surgeons than these 52 uh, surgeons. Most recently, transanal total mesorectal excision in the study done by Pat Silla, published in Surgical Endoscopy, um, showed that um, patients in higher volume centers did very, very well, even with this new technique. Neadjuvant therapy has replaced adjuvant therapy. We do intersphincteric resections, both hand-sewn and stapled, um, near complete or complete 90%. So we've gotten much, much better than we used to be. Um, and as a result, patients are doing better, but it's safe and experienced hands. The, the problem we find is that there's a discordance with pathologists, just like surgeons might disagree, pathologists disagree. So in these 100 TME specimens, There was concordance in only about half. Minor and major discordance ultimately resolved, and there were changes, major changes in the final TME grade in 5%. So the training of the surgeon is important. The training of the pathologist is also important. And and and, um, here's the um, uh, study. I I go back to it. I apologize. I don't know how the slides got out of order here. But when you have colorectal trained surgeons, they operated on they're more likely to operate on more distal tumors despite the tumors being more distal somebody who's colorectal trained is far more likely to perform a low anterior section rather than an abdominal perineal resection where somebody who's not colorectal trained is more likely to give a patient a permanent colostomy and you might say well that's acceptable if it made a difference in local recurrence or disease-free survival, and that's not the case because the colorectal trained surgeons who were doing higher volumes of cases offered their patients the lowest local recurrence rates, whereas the lower volume non-colorectal trained surgeons were giving their patients almost a 50% rate of local recurrence. And in the middle were colorectal trained surgeons doing lower volumes and non-colorectal trained general surgeons doing higher volumes. So this is the best scenario you could come up with. Uh, Same was true for disease-free survival as for local recurrence. So that colorectal training as well as volume had very high and significant hazards ratios 
for outcomes. And it's been shown all around the world in, in all these different countries and others that if you're doing a high volume and or you're trained in colorectal surgery, your patients will have lower morbidity, lower mortality, lower rates of local recurrence. In fact, Helen Dorrance in the UK showed that patients operated upon by a general surgeon were three and a half times more likely to develop a local recurrence than patients operated by a colorectal surgeon. Well, in the US, we had the same problem. And here you can see that um, in, in the US, 26% of all counties were, were high stoma rate counties, where 60% or more of patients with rectal cancer got permanent colostomy. 60%, mean of 71%, huge number. And this is a relatively recent study. And there were certain common themes. These hospitals were less likely to have MRI scans, PET scans, less likely to have teaching hospitals in those geographic regions, and fewer specialty surgeons. Using the uh, na nationwide inpatient sample, which is a 20% stratified random sample of U.S. inpatients over a 15-year period, you can see here 60% of patients, 60% ended up with a colostomy. Most radical resections got a colostomy. And looking at county-level data here, in 20,000 proctectomies, half were abdominal perineal resections. And you can look here at Florida, for example, California, New York. You can look by different states and then within each state by different counties and look at the rates. And for example, low colostomy rates, only 2.2% of counties. It's abysmal. It's appalling. It's frightening. Shocking. Whereas 61% or greater is about a quarter of all counties in the U.S. So there's a lot of work to do. And, and a lot of the avoidance of permanent colostomy was based on specialization and volume again. So um, 7,500 proctectomies, 2,600 surgeons, um, the surgeons who performed only APRs were not specialty trained. And that's, again, the same problem. Um, specialty surgeons go uh, uh, the extra mile, if you will, and feel comfortable doing a restorative resection. And the U.S., we're at the bottom of the barrel. If you look in Norway, Netherlands, U.K., Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, Sweden, Germany, Australia, so on, all of them have lower colostomy rates than we do. And we also have the worst circumferential resection margin positivity rates. Ours, 17%. France, 3%. Germany, 3.5%. Uh, Netherlands, Poland, U.K. So it's a problem. And then the last issue is, is stool frequency and, and bowel function. And this has to do with reconstruction. And, and Klaus Matzel from Erlangen, Germany, showed many years ago that, re, that function is impaired. It now has a name, low anterior section syndrome. At that time, it didn't have a name. And we know that the lower the level of the anastomosis, the higher is stool frequency, the higher the rate of incontinence, more difficulty discriminating, the more rectum left behind, the lower the stool frequency, the lower the rate of incontinence, better discriminatory ability and, and less uh, anal pain. And so you can do a straight anastomosis and that's what most people would, would do, but side to end, coloplasty and J pouches are alternatives to give people a little better function. Um, there's also problems with when you do um, not only ileal pouch, but colon pouch, any proctectomy, you have to counsel patients about these quality of life issues. So you need to be in a position where you have a team to deal with these patients. We know that by adding a, a colonic J pouch, and this is a randomized controlled trial we did with 100 patients, we know that by adding a colonic J pouch, not only do we decrease the bowel frequency, but we also decrease the rate of anastomotic leak from 15% to 2%, perhaps because it's an end to side anastomosis. But tremendous benefit to having a uh, lower stool frequency. And that's been shown in, in Asia as well. Yikang Ho uh, and Miranda Tan, Francis Sao Chun, showing that straight versus pouch confers significant benefit for patients. These are our data. Um, and you can see for at least one year, patients with the colonic J pouch enjoying better function, having less urgency. 
ultimately, as time went on, far away from our uh, randomized control trial and, and uh, the Asian randomized control trial, you can see this comparative study of J pouch to side to end and side to end and coloplasty or other options. Um, colonic J pouch had the lowest stool frequency. Transverse coloplasty, though, although having similar outcomes for function, it's a much higher rate of anastomotic leak. And so transverse coloplasty has really gone away. And in this day and age, I would say the way people construct reservoirs is either a J pouch or a side to end coloanal anastomosis to leave a little bit of a blind stump. And all of that's brought us to the uh, National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer, which, as I say, I've spent 12 years creating and, and chairing. It's a joint initiative of all of these different surgical societies, as well as the College of American Pathologists and the American College of Radiology. So when we looked to try to establish this program, we tried to look at our uh, performance measures and say, based on the performance measures, the standards, so the process measures and the performance measures and the quality improvement measures, are we making an impact having this national program where we emphasize working as a team with radiation oncology, medical oncology, uh, imaging, surgery, pathology, and so on, Indeed, we found that the, all of the process measures are only followed in 28%, all of the performance measures in only 56% of patients. And when we ask patient, patients, when we ask centers how they're doing with our 20 standards in the NAPRC, the mean compliance was only 10.6. And just like I said about surgeon volumes earlier, having better outcomes, compliance was better in the high volume centers, which was only four centers meaning 30 rectal resections a year. Not a big number for a center. Um, this is an interesting way of looking at it, and this study was done in Cleveland, Ohio, the idea of having a multidisciplinary team. So the way this study worked is the surgeon had an idea of how he, in this case they were all men surgeons, but how he was going to manage uh, the patient then presented the patient looking at the MRI, reviewing the uh, CT scan, chest, abdomen, pelvis, the CEA, the pathology report, endoscopy findings, and discussing as a group with uh, radiation oncology, with medical oncology, pathology, and so on, discussing the uh, MDT findings and having a consensus there was a change in management in roughly a quarter of all patients. And it didn't matter whether the surgeon was junior, mid-career, senior, those changes occurred for everybody. So this is what I call the wisdom of the crowd. And the results here supported the uh, creation of the NAPRC. So if we did follow all of those measures, would we make an impact? And one of our recent publications looked at 50,000 patients in the National Cancer Database, six process measures evaluated, being the pathologist having assessed the proximal and distal margin, treatment started within 60 days, circumferential resection margin that I discussed earlier, clinical staging, tumor regression, CEA. So all process measures were done in only 23.6%, unfortunately, which is a problem. And what we found is if, if, all of the performance measures had been done and we mathematically extrapolated, about 600 lives would be saved per year in the US. Um, are we ready to do that? Well, really not. Very, very few hospitals are meeting the standards. And even though we have close to 100 accredited hospitals now, there's a lot of work to do to get us to the point where we work as a team and ensure that everybody has had these things done in every case. Um, and there are arguments against it, too. And I know this applies in India, that if you have regionalized surgery, you're going to have better outcomes, but it costs money. And that's a problem. And so this is always the balance. Do you go and you see Dr. Mishra, an expert in a regional center, or do you stay in your village and have it done by somebody who doesn't really do this procedure very often? And this is always a balance. So the standardization of care and establishment of high volume centers of excellence definitely improves outcomes. 
The standards have been applied nationally by the ACS, and the, which is the National Accreditation Program for Rectal Cancer, reports to the Commission on Cancer, which is under the American College of Surgeons. But the data definitely support high volume centers, just like, again, like Dr. Mishra having high volume laparoscopy. He's an expert. I just saw part of a video. I can tell. I mean, he is absolutely you know, very, very technically adept and great judgment. And you get that with volume. So I know there's a bit of a different talk without videos, but I really wanted to kind of end the year sharing my passion with you because I have spent 12 years developing this program. Uh, there are eight societies involved. Again, there are four surgical societies, American College of Surgeons, American Society of Colorectal Surgeons, Society of American Gastrointestinal and Endoscopic Surgeons, Society for Surgical Oncology, uh, and um, Soci Society for Surgery of the Alimentary Tract, plus the Commission on Cancer, which is multidisciplinary and involves the public, and the American College of Radiology, and the College of American Pathology. So we have eight organizations in total behind this effort, about 100 hospitals now accredited, and about 30 more looking for accreditation. So we are definitely making strides in trying to achieve our goal of optimizing uh, rectal cancer outcomes throughout the U.S. So I hope that's a somewhat germane. And if you like, in January, I can show some different videos on, on rectal cancer surgery techniques. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Is there any question from audience? Dr. Bhalla? Yes. Please ask, what is your question? Ask a question. Speak a bit louder. Hello. Like, uh, thank you, uh, Stephen Victor. Uh, in the era of uh, uh, where uh, you are giving uh, therapy, where not only you are giving therapy, and even you are giving LCRT, that is uh, long course chemo RT, uh, in that case, there is a uh, concept of uh, weight and box policy in a lower rectal cancer treatment. So, is it uh, uh, not going to affect the rectal surgeon as per se? Because I am a surgical nurse who entered the total rectal surgery. So I am asking a doubt where uh, the era of where we have total year to enter B, where tumor will completely resolve and patient will be clinically complete response and will be followed up with the MRI. So is it a consider? Uh, is it is it not a uh, considerable thing for a rectal surgeon where uh, we have so much patient we are following weight and bunch policy rather than doing any rectal surgery? I'm I'm not sure. So you're asking about the role of neoadjuvant and total neoadjuvant therapy and wait and watch? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Between surgery and wait and watch after in a high risk non cancers. Yeah, I mean it's a it's a totally it, it is definitely a related topic, but within the context of you know 20, 25 minute lecture and five to ten minutes discussion, I, I didn't cover it. I'm happy to put it in another lecture. Uh, no issue whatsoever to talk about the role of new adjuvant therapy. Definitely, we follow the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines, and the NCCN guidelines uh, do indicate for a threatened circumferential resection margin the use of neoadjuvant therapy, which now has evolved to total neoadjuvant therapy. Then the question is do we do induction chemotherapy followed by chemoradiotherapy? followed by either wait and watch if a complete response or surgery, or do we do consolidation chemotherapy where we do chemotherapy and radiation, then additional chemo, then assess for the candidacy for wait and watch or proceed with surgery. And, and that absolutely is our practice. Um, we don't use adjuvant therapy because we have a very low threshold uh to use total new adjuvant and a very high and we try to be obviously compliant with the nccn guidelines so adjuvant therapy is really gone even standard new adjuvant is very seldom used it's almost always total new adjuvant uh, rare circumstances it wouldn't be mostly if the patient doesn't want it or or somehow has adverse reactions to it our wait and watch rate is about 30 percent, 35 percent complete response wait and watch require to, to put somebody in a wait and watch protocol requires that there is no evidence by digital examination or endoscopy or mri of any residual or recurrent abnormalities other than a little telangiectasia or whitish scar 
no exophytic lesion, no granulation tissue, nothing else there, certainly nothing beneath the surface in the MRI. Those patients, there's no role for, no, no role. We don't perform biopsy of the lesion. That makes it harder to follow. Those patients will get follow-up every three months for two years, then every six months for two years, then annually. And that follow-up is endoscopic inspection, alternating sigmoidoscopy colonoscopy, as indicated, and MRI, CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, um, CEA blood test, every one of those intervals. So I, I hope that answers the question. Yes. So thank you for thank you for your valuable time, Prof. Again, see you in Germany and thanks for your valuable time. Thank you. My pleasure. We can start out with rectal cancer. Wishing everyone a happy, healthy new year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thanks, Dr. Mishra. So now it's over today. Tomorrow we will again start and tomorrow we are take, going to take a lecture of mistakes and errors in minimal access surgery. And after that for gynecologists, I will also discuss the difficult college hysterectomy how to perform for surgeon. And for gynecologists also a couple of more topics we will discuss. Tomorrow we have, as I told you that Dr. Uh, Sudhir Srivastava, he will be our this chief guest who is the honor of the SSI Foundation, that is Mantra Robot in India. And uh, he is a eminent cardiothoracic surgeon of the United States of America. And he has done, you know, 9,000 robotic cardiothoracic surgery. In that, he has done the cardiac bypass, cardiac tumor, and all other robotic procedures. So he will be our chief guest. So see you tomorrow. Now we are over for today. Thank you very much. Thank you.